Okay. <laughs> My communications director trusts me. He trusts yeah, yeah. me to tell the truth as Completely. I see it. Um, I yes. hope that's true. Besides, he knows I'm not going to look at the camera and yell anything like, Infidel! <laughs> hey, the camera's on! Okay. <laughs> okay. I can say that. Infidel! But... Infidel! All right, so now we're starting. All right, thanks for having <clears throat> Hey, congratulations! Thank you very much. Appreciate third it. Third term. Yep, third term. Yeah. Hard to believe. Yeah, so how does it feel? It feels like, gotta work. Got work to do. So, all right. Why is it that, first of all, you ran on a post? That's a comp. Well, you know, look. I, I mean, I. The, the easy answer is, well, you know, people are really happy with the job we're doing, etc. The other way I deal with it is to tell a, you know, tell a joke about my Italian heritage and how everybody's scared to run against me. I think there are some real structural reasons why it's hard for somebody to run for city attorney. If you are, first of all, you have to have a certain number of years of experience as an attorney under the charter. Okay. But. Assuming you have that, if you're working at a large firm, um, you're basically letting your employer know, or your partners know, a year and a half in advance that you intend to leave. So that's difficult for people to do. Second, uh, although I'm very happy and it's a, it's, a, it's a good paying job as a public servant, it's not comparable to what someone with the same experience makes in the private sector if they're successful. So but to that eliminates... you're the highest paid elected official in California. Actually, I'm not. Oh, you were surpassed? No, I'm not. Yeah, I've been surpassed. Uh, the, the sheriff of, uh, of uh, Santa Clara County makes more. The, and, and when you get away from electeds, when right. you get to just public servants, there's yeah, hundreds. There's yeah. I mean, you know, the, the attorney for the general counsel for the state of, uh, for the state university, pardon me, for the University of California, makes more than double the uh, attorney. Right? Oh yeah, nearly 400. Oh, oh, oh. That, I don't know what the rest of the package is. Uh, the um, attorney for the Port of Oakland makes more and has many fewer lawyers. Mm. So, you know, but, but I'm, I'm certainly, I don't mean that to sound like a complaint. I'm very happy with it. It's, it's a good job. But a lot of people looking at it are going to say, why would I want to take that big of, to have to campaign to take that big of a pay cut in order to have everybody in the world looking over my shoulder in terms of the legal judgments I make. Right. Um, so a lot of people are eliminated on that basis from a, career, uh, from a career path basis. Then the people who are not in the larger firms who have their own small practices uh, are usually not in a position to be able to spend the time it takes to run for office and maintain their practice of law. So. I think there are some, you know, I've been really giving this some thought, and I think there are, I think it helps that, that um, I think we have done a good job in this office, but I think there are some structural reasons why it's a limited pool of potential opponents uh, that could come out. So the other question I have, and folks, here, this guy is my friend, okay? So people who read our blog kind of know that, but if you've seen this for the first time, I come with that bias, and I think it's important that you know that. So that question, uh -huh. and this question for you, um, what, from your perspective, you, you, is the biggest accomplishment? Oh, well, uh, if you, if you, permit me three, okay? okay. Yeah. Number one, first and foremost, I, Neighborhood Law Corps. Uh, neighborhood Law Corps, it's won national and state awards, um, and these are not like, you know, awards where they give out 30 of these a year. We're talking about grand prize in the state, grand prize in the nation right. for most innovative new government program. Um, and so I'd say and the, the lawyers, lawyers... That's where you send young lawyers out to be at, you know, since your eyes and ears in the community? Yeah, they, they become... Well, what, what happens is we send these young lawyers into the community and their work program, their agenda, is determined by the community itself and not by City Hall. And that allows us to really dig into some tough and intractable problems. Uh, it's all civil side. It's all nuisance and blight and those types of things. If there are little young lawyers watching this, they want to get involved. How do they do that? Uh, they call our office, and uh, we have uh, two, right two three eight three eight one four two three eight. Uh, they call two three eight three six zero one. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for that, um, so so the law court I think would be number one because we started it from scratch. No one had done it before. Uh, it was largely privately funded for its first five years of existence, so the taxpayers didn't have to take the risk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on creating a new program that, frankly, you know, was on the edge, and we didn't know if it would work sending young lawyers out to the community, you know, to <laughs> work at the direction of the community. So that was one. 
Two, uh, I'm very, very proud of the fact that we do spend a lot less money than we used to on lawyers and lawsuits. Uh, when you look at the number of claims, the number of claims against the city is an average of about 550 a year now for the last three years. It was 1,000 a year all through wow. the 1990s. The uh, number of lawsuits definitely has gone down dramatically against the city. Um, so we've been able to cut from a, a rolling average when I became city attorney of in excess of $7 million a year uh, that we were spending on claims and payouts, where now uh, the last several years have been under $6 million. This year coming up is going to be a little over $6 million. It's going to be this fiscal year ending this month. And we don't have any lawsuits six the sports two. anymore. Oh, no, we got rid of those. So I'm, I'm happy with that. But that's all part of that package right. of being more effective at, at protecting taxpayer money. Uh, and then third, I'm, I'm very proud that this office has won awards for diversity. Um, we are, according to the uh, California Minority Council program, uh, when they gave us our award, we are the most diverse law office in the state of California. And wow. I think we stand as a, um, a direct rebuke to anybody who still believes that there is a trade-off between diversity and excellence. Right. Um, I, I've been blessed to be leading an office at a time when if I need uh, a twenty, and if I need a redevelopment negotiator attorney with in excess of twenty years experience, there actually are African American women and mm -hmm. men and Latino women and men because those barriers were broken in the seventies and eighties. Right. These folks now have sufficient experience. So, back in the sixties or seventies, you might have had to say, "Well, if I want to get some diversity, I'm going to have to go to less experienced attorneys." I'm not faced with that trade-off anymore. And so if you really make an effort, you can have just the most excellent people and you can reflect the diversity of the city. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Why, um, or I should make your phrases, how is Oakland changing in your opinion? Well, um, I think Oakland is become more of a, well, clearly it's become more of a city of uh, extremes in the sense of professionals versus service workers. Uh, this, as is true throughout most Rust Belt cities in the country, and Oakland, to be properly understood, has to be understood as a Rust Belt city. Uh, so the high-paying private sector jobs that are blue-collar jobs. Joke. Folks, every time I talk to this guy, there's a siren. I don't know what's going on with the glass. Oh, that's because they're coming for you. <laughs> I know, all the time. Um, I, I called them. I let them know you were Thanks. here. Um, it's, it's a Rust Belt city, and that process continues. Um, you know, this is a city that had auto plants, it had canneries, it had steel plants and, and machine shops. Those are all gone. Um, what I think you're starting to see and what is changing in the city is you're starting to see um, more diversity of political opinion. I think this last campaign, this last election, where nearly every count, all the council members were challenged, although all of them uh, survived those challenges. Safe for District 3, we still have a count going. There's still a count going, but it would be very unusual yeah, I agree. given those numbers that, um, and in any event, the incumbent would be clearly in the lead going into a runoff. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Nate Dillon, mm -hmm. District 3. Right. Strong challenger in Sean Sullivan. Sean's a good example of uh, what I'm about to talk about. Um, you're starting to see candidates like Sean Sullivan um, who are coming forward and are not nearly as tied into the existing, you know, we don't have parties, right? right no, right, right? Everybody's right. a Democrat. But you kind of had two vague groups in the city, sort of the Dumbs Lee, mm -hmm. uh, progressive, uh, together with uh, middle class African American coalition camp. Yeah. camp. And then you kind of have the, uh, the Asian Latino, and, and these are broad generalizations, sure. granted, but uh, Asian Latino, uh, empowerment access together with this sort of more, if you will, pragmatic power liberalism like a Don right. um, And everything sort of referred into those two camps. And so you'd get somebody like an Hugh Harris who really mm -hmm. kind of straddled both camps right. very effectively, I thought, uh, and didn't get the credit that he deserved as mayor. I agree. Um, but what you're starting to see in these elections, when you see for example, Central Labor Council endorse a realtor like a Mario Juarez, mm -hmm. and the Chamber of Commerce endorse a 
union leader like Ignacio de la Fuente, you're starting to see ferment and chaos mm -hmm. and breakdown of what has been about 25 years of this two-sided equation. And I don't know where it goes any. Well, you know, I don't know where it ends up, but, right. but it's going to be very exciting for the city because I think it's going to mean more choices for the public and a uh, more open and healthy discourse about ideal issues that have been ideologically polarized. But having said that, it reminds me of something that I wrote last night, which is in part why I'm bleary-eyed, is that it seems to me that, and correct me if you think that I'm wrong, in every district election, we seldom have had the same incumbent and challenger. We've always had an incumbent and different challengers. Mm -hmm. So the incumbent always wins, but there's no one that, for example, let's take Amy Alice, mm -hmm. right? She didn't run again. I think she ran twice already, Well, right? she did run twice, she yeah. Didn't run she twice, did run right, twice, right. But she, arguably, if she tried again, if she took a look at the same situation in District 2 and said, I'm gonna try that for that again, and she's maintaining her profile, perhaps could win. But other than Amy, I don't see anyone else that's been a consistent face out there. I was thinking in terms of District 3 and Nadell because there are people that are upset that Nadell won. And I point out that among other things, I felt Nancy had changed. And I felt that uh, she, among other things, when all is said and done, her district is improved. There's, there's no question. I mean, and Nancy and I have been friends for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we obviously disagree often on policy when we were both on council. But um, I think the point you're making in a broader sense is that we have not, and, and this is true, baby boom politicians have done a uniquely bad job of bringing along new talent. Uh, and, and there are a lot of theories around that. Uh, is it because the baby boom generation, having grown up self-identified as the youth generation, cannot conceive outside of, of, of itself being the youthfulness, and therefore uh, doesn't think of itself in a role as sort of wiser, older, mentoring young people along and prefers to point ah, the finger at hence, younger people. Hence the schism between Hillary Clinton and her older Democrats and Barack Obama and the younger generation. There's no question about it. I mean, when you look, what's fascinating to me is when you listen on television as they describe that, well, you know, women are for Hillary. And you right. say, well, no, no, women under 30 are for Barack. Um, African-American women are for Barack. What you've got are, and, and when you get to the 30 to 50 range, they're pretty split. It's when you get women over 50 years old, in other words, baby boom women, mm -hmm. they're for Hillary because she represents, um, she represents empowerment, smashing through glass ceilings, all those positive things. And on a darker side, it's possible that she represents, um, a, she represents a, a uh, vengeance for a grievance. Right. Right. because of what happened between her and Bill and the humiliation with Bill doing what he did with Monica Lewinsky and all that. I mean, there's a lot of psycho mm -hmm. drama. And I, you know, you, when you start getting into that kind of discussion, especially as an elected official, you want to be careful. But uh, these things are complicated. They are not clean where you can say, this factor is this percentage of it, this factor is that percentage. Indivi for every individual, there's a different mix about what's at play. Um, but there's no question in my mind that uh, Barack Obama is a general to be put in that context to be properly understood. Any attempts to pigeonhole him or by his own supporters to render it some type of a racial candidacy uh, largely missed the boat as I see it. He is, he is a, a, a generational uh, sign. A question and then we'll wind our way back to open now. Who did you pick in as President Johnny? Uh, I think he could have, but uh, in the past mm -hmm. it, would, it would have been possible, but at this juncture, she damaged herself. I think the way this last few dance steps went, uh, not so much her, I mean, she's been criticized for not having been gracious on the night, this historic night when first African American to lead a party is being selected, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, I, I think that's actually forgivable because you're, you know, these are people, they're tired, it's been a long, long road. She's got to be horrifically disappointed. Um, and it is the nature of the Clintons to never say uncle. So uh, I'm not surprised, and, and I don't put a lot of weight in. Would it have been nice if she had been more gracious? Yes. Um, could you run up, up up the flag a theory that, well, how baby boom is that, that you're never not the center of attention? <laughs> um, um, you know, that's, that, I mean, you could make that too, but, but I don't have a problem with what she did. What happened the day after, when she clearly authorized 
um, Lanny Davis, her right. friend and counsel, to go start Ooh, writing a petition. Emails out. That's to go start running a petition. Read my, read my column, folks. Uh, when she clearly authorized uh, or, or acknowledged or coordinated with Bob Johnson from BET to start calling black caucus members. Um, once she started doing that, I think she made it very difficult for Obama to offer her. I, I think she overplayed the hand. And now for him to offer her the vice presidential nomination, um, while on the short term, if you look at it, you'd say, well, he's reaching out for unity in the party. That may be true with that over 50 segment of women who are pro-Hillary, and, and they do need to be addressed, and, 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 and their, their uh, platform, to the extent it does differ from the Obama platform, given a court. Um, I think the way it'll be viewed by the people we need to win over is that Hillary Clinton can, can yank Barack Obama's chain anytime she wants, that he will then own all of Hillary Clinton's baggage, mm -hmm. And I think Including one of the not calling the court case of Peter Call. Actually, it's well, not ongoing. One of the one of the things that has been fascinating to me about this campaign has been uh, what, in some ways, what a great media management operation the Clintons have had in setting the terms of the debate. For example, that she's more experienced, right. or what kind of experience? Right. right. Okay, but we don't. We just accept that she's more experienced, and maybe she is, by the way. But. They've also created this illusion that, well, she's been fully vetted, and so you know what you're getting, and she can win. Well, actually, Obama, because of his style, never really attacked her right. on a personal level. Right. And so, while you can say that she's been vetted on a lot of things that were largely BS, like Whitewater, like Vince Foster, mm -hmm. things like that, um, and while we can all assume that Monica is going to come back up sure. and her role with, with, you know, in terms of how the Lewinsky scandal was handled, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of new things like the pardons on the way out the door that the Clintons issued, right. um, the, the nature of Bill Clinton's relationships with his foundation as far as the donations he's gotten, all of that vetting. And I meant the Peter Paul scandal, which the mainstream media has ignored. All of that vetting has to take place. And once you go through that, it really dilutes and blunts Obama's uh, message of change and doing things in new ways. So she was always going to be a difficult choice for VP. But when you now add to it the fact that selecting her for VP would, uh, would be an emblem of weakness and an, an ability to be bullied, um, he doesn't need to do that. What he should do is he should make her a partner in the selection of his VP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he should say to her, look, uh, we have a committee, we have this group, you know, that they named the other day, it's Holder and Johnson mm -hmm. and Kennedy. Right. Um, we're going to vet everybody, and uh, we're going to come up with a list of, of, you know, three or four or five mm -hmm. that are acceptable to the group and that are acceptable to me. I'm going to let you pick. Okay, okay, so not Hillary, who should it be in your opinion? Uh, I think... You could go a number of different directions. The three that are most intriguing to me are one, uh, pardon me, there's four that are, that are interesting, but, but one is less so than the others. Um, the three Democrats would be either uh, Jim Webb in Virginia, mm -hmm. to put Virginia in play, right. and also for national security credentials, and a former member of the Reagan administration, and a former Republican. Right. Right. Two, Evan Bayh from Indiana, mm -hmm. long traditional family out of Indiana, uh, tries to get you into some of the area of the country where Obama seems weak, like Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, uh, West Virginia, Appalachia. Right. Three, uh, Kathleen Sebelius from right. Kansas. She was just here last Friday. Yeah, last, was here last Friday. Puts a woman on the mm -hmm. puts a woman on the ticket for you. Uh, and little known, they, is, they describe her as the nice Hillary. Well, and the fundraiser. People, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm not I'm not going there because that's irrelevant to me. But Kathleen Sebelius. Uh, would put Kansas in play. It is Barack's home state. Little, little mention, though, is that she is the daughter of the former governor of Ohio, Gilligan, who was a very popular awesome. governor. Yeah. So she, ostensibly, you would imagine, maintains contacts in Ohio right. as well, which would help Barack. Bloodline. So I would say those three, Webb by Sibelius. Mm -hmm. And then the outside play that I've heard people discuss that I think is a, is a fascinating one, although I don't think 
because of the divisiveness of the Clinton-Obama race, it's possible, uh, but I feel like I should throw it in, is uh, Chuck Hagel, is to reach out to a Republican with national security credentials, a veteran, a Vietnam so a veteran, on that an opposition and an opponent about of the war in Iraq. Right, right. Uh, that would be, I think, a fascinating choice um, for Obama to make and might signal really some different politics. I'm not sure the Democratic Party could handle that. So no Edwards and no Richardson on your, on your list? Well, Richardson is a good choice because he puts New Mexico in play. Mm -hmm. Tremendous credentials. I'm concerned, and I, I really don't know, I'm concerned that uh, given his his endorsement of Obama and the reaction by people like Carville, who called him a Judas, for it, that he may be radioactive to the Clinton people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you do have to make sure that whoever you pick for vice president is not just merely tolerated, but actually uh, embraced by Hillary Clinton. Right, absolutely. And Edwards? Um, I probably, for some of the same reasons, I think that might be a problem. Fascinating, fascinating. Coming back to Oakland, what is your That's speculation, plan? by the way. I, mean, I got I you. I know this is all, this I'm is not saying stuff. this is a journalist, I'm saying like right. any other, right. any other guy, any other mook sitting at a bar. Okay. Okay. So I need a cocktail. Um, what has your office done to help fight crime in Oakland? Because crime has been a, a large problem. Well, you know, the, the law corps really handled some problem properties, and, that, mm -hmm. and, and if, you, if you subscribe to the broken window theory, of public safety, um, that everything matters, then closing down problem liquor stores where you had drug dealing and gambling and women being hassled, and that those do contribute to improving the, the quality of life in our neighborhoods. And I can show you blocks where we really have changed people's lives with, with how folks live. Uh, shutting down um, houses that are dominated by illegal activities, gun running, drugs, etc., uh, which we've done to the extent that we've actually bulldozed houses in some places, mm. which is really sad in a way, mm. but, but uh, is a way to handle things. That particular house had, it was not reusable, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, but we have a proposal in front of the council right now, and to the extent people from Oakland are watching your, um, your blog here and watch a video, you call the council to support this proposal. We have a proposal that we're bringing jointly. Phone number. Uh, Call council offices 238-3266 uh, and tell them you want support for the community prosecution program, uh, which is a partnership between our office and the Alameda County District Attorney's Office to provide more resources to deal with misdemeanor crimes in the city. Noise ordinance, uh, noise ordinance violations, um, illegal toxic dumping, um, uh, sort of a chop shops, things, mm -hmm. things that contribute, the, the, the things that create the environment in which a violent crime is not just likely, but almost inevitable. Uh, we need to go get at those root causes. Um, it's by the time you catch the guy who shot somebody, the victim's already dead. It's too late. We have to work this city and improve the tone and improve the way people get to live and reclaim the public space in this city. And that is a hard fight. There is no alpha to omega solution. Our office certainly can't and will not provide an alpha to omega solution. We can't. We're not the police department. We're not the jobs agencies. Those things are all much more important in some ways. But there are things that a city attorney's office can do with some imagination and just a small bit of resources. Uh, in the case of the community prosecution program, we're talking about less than $600,000 to provide an attorney in each of the three po new police uh, mm -hmm. sectors mm -hmm. to work directly with the community, mm -hmm. with the NCPCs, the Neighborhood Crime Prevention Councils, mm -hmm. and Oakland Police Department, as well as taking uh, taking uh, consulting with the council members for these districts to be able to go after problems that the district attorney just doesn't have the resources to go after. Mm. Uh, they'd like to go right. after if they had unlimited resources, but they're dealing with violent crime and they're dealing with, with you know, felonies. And, and right here like in Oakland, it's logical that you have this program to it's help out. And, that's, right. and we are there to help out. We will be working very closely. We'll be deputized by the district attorney's office, which is what state law requires. And we're very excited about that program. We want to get into the action. Now, in the interest of time, and we've got quite a few Raider fans out there that email me constantly about different issues. And then, of course, in the NFL, I understand that 
the city has been having meetings with the Oakland Raiders. Uh, the Joint Powers Authority has been having meetings with the Oakland Raiders. And I understand uh, Los Angeles doesn't even have an NFL team. Yeah. I think it, I, I wouldn't put it so much for this just on sort of a mass municipal psychology basis. Mm -hmm. I think I would look at it as what are the options competing for not necessarily your entertainment dollar, but something much more valuable, which is your time. Right. And that sort of people who live in California, um, and particularly in the Bay Area where you are, you know, you're an hour and a half from the wine country, mm -hmm. you're an hour from some of the most beautiful coastline on the planet, you're an hour from fabulous redwood groves. Mm -hmm. You're an hour from, you know, lakes and we and have boating and, and, and we and between um, college and sports, we've got the most teams active. I think over any region except New York. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I you know, no, no, I, no surprise here. You know, as a New Yorker, uh, you know, I look at um, you know some of the fans in, in the Bay Area, and I always think, oh God, these guys are just such a bunch of front runners. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas if you know you're me and you grew up rooting for the Mets when they finished in last place every yeah. year, <laughs> uh, you know, you root for your team no matter what, and you complain about them and you yell at them, but that's right. your team and that's it. And whereas you know in the Bay Area, people kind of when you're winning they show up, and when you're not winning they don't show up. Although that wasn't necessarily uh, as true, say with the Warriors. Um, but I just think that the variety of leisure options here, and also because our weather is not as extreme. Right. So all year round, if you really like to hike, you can hike all year round. Mm -hmm. If you really like to boat, you can boat all year round. If you really like golf, with the exception of maybe six weeks of the year, you can golf all year round. And that's not true anywhere else in the country, just about anywhere that's else true. in the country. Yeah, right. And I think so when you put, and then the kind of people who move here are, as a result, seeking that more active lifestyle, not because they think they're gonna live forever mm -hmm. or because they're vain, although there are people who do think they're vain, <laughs> and there are people who are very vain, right. but it's, it's that life. And so those people tend not to be as sedentary, and let's face it, uh, you know, being a sports spectator while it's very, um, it's invigorating and it's stimulating, it is not all that physically challenging. Are you sit and watch? Uh, you sit and watch. Right, but and it's always been the economic development, it's almost like the economic development aspect and the idea that you can put a city like Oakland on the map. That's what people are getting at. So uh, yeah, the map there. thing, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of value, as I said earlier, I think there's a lot of branding value depending on the reputations of the teams and how the teams are viewed. There's branding value to having big teams. Oakland is much better known, say, than Long Beach, even though they're the same size, very similar towns. Long Beach actually has a bigger port. Mm -hmm. Long Beach is very diverse, just as Oakland is. Right. Long Beach is near another big city, Los Angeles in the case of Long Beach, Oakland, San Francisco. But when I was growing up in New York, I knew Oakland. I knew what Oakland was because there was the Oakland A's, the Oakland, the uh, the Warriors mm -hmm. played in Oakland. This is not a team that a lot of. I'm not prepared to comment one way or the other on that, but I, the, the meetings have gone very well. And a lot of my folks want to know if the Raiders are going to get a new stadium. Um, in your opinion? In, in my opinion? Yes. Probably not anytime soon. Certainly not until the current set of bonds are, are defeased and paid off. Which is 2016. Yeah, it's a little while yet. Right. Well, I think, I think not too far I think, off. No, it's not. <laughs> I, think, I think what we're more likely looking at, Zenny, is... Uh, pardon me. I think what we're looking at... Oh, is, shh! I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Don't file a claim. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, What's well, on camera? Nothing happened, right? This is up The... Um, <laughs> the uh, I think what we're looking at in terms of what we want to do with the Raiders is something that will enable us to continue uh, to work on the improvements in the relationship mm -hmm. that have uh, been worked on and, and which the Raiders, uh, to their credit, after we got done with the last litigation, actually reached out to the Joint Powers Authority. Hmm. Um, that's a first. Really? Well, that's, you know, I haven't done that before. Look, I don't, want to, I don't want to respond to that just because it seems like almost like, oh, well, it's about time. No, and right. that's not what we're saying. Right. They reached out and understood that a better tone to the relationship was in everybody's interest, mm -hmm. theirs included, and, um, and that they're a part of this community. And they've always been good at being a part of the that's community what I was as an organization. Yeah. Yeah. They've always been good. It's only been dealing with the politicians where there's been the problem. And you know, after being here at City Hall for 14 mm -hmm. years, 
I gotta say that I've developed some sympathy. <laughs> what it's like to deal with, with politicians because politicians are very, um, you know, a lot of them are very interesting and bright people, but they are, they are hard, can be hard to deal with. Will we ever strong. get to the point where a team owner, Mr. Davis or Mr. Davis, whoever it happens to be, can walk in with the mayor and say, we want a Super Bowl? Because that's ideally, you, you, I didn't have that situation. No, you didn't. You, you really, o Oakland has some... Oakland has some challenges there in that you don't have mayors tending to be elected in Oakland who are the kind of you know men or women who are big sports fans. Yeah. We tend to elect people whose lives are very wrapped up in politics and causes, which is good mm -hmm. on that level. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to really appreciate the role that sports plays in a community it's not a quantitative analysis purely. There is a qualitative function that is much more easily understood if you're a sports freak yourself. But some would say that it's caught up, and I've heard this nationally, and I want to get your response to it, just as a, as a guy at a bar, okay? Mm -hmm. Not as a city attorney, no, I'm sure. right? But look, the West Coast is narcissistic. The South has a, 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 a point, like Atlanta, they have an insecurity. Jacksonville has been insecurity, so they want something that brings attention to them. Don't you really think that's part of that? We think, hey, we've got it all, and why do we need events like, like oh, No question. Look at the good point, Auckland. Long Beach is, isn't that a town on Long Island? <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, you're right. You wonder. Right. I don't know. I don't know. That's Long Branch. Yeah. Right. Who knows? They speak of that. So that makes a difference. This is my last question. We can talk about this yeah. another time, but in more detail. But it has to do with you're from New York. Yeah. And this has to do with New York politics and Clinton. There's a feeling. Um, that Hillary Clinton may have overplayed her hand in another way, okay. in that her approval rating in New York is 60%. Charlie Rangel went publicly and said, hey, that speech was terrible. And not only that, if you run for governor, you got Char they, you got Patterson over here, first African-American governor of New York, blind, great role model. You can't run against him. If you do that, we're going to sink you. If you were advising Hillary right now regarding how she should treat New York, what would you say to her? Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> I have no idea because I haven't lived in New York for, for more than 20 years now. And right. So I really don't understand New York politics anymore. Mm -hmm. um, any more than any other Californian who reads the papers from time to time would understand it. I don't know what any of that means. I don't know a lot about Governor Patterson. Yeah. Also, so, he's a great speaker. Well, no, I, I know that he's, well, I know he's a good speaker. I know, he's Spitzer. Legal, I know he's legally blind. I know that he replaced Spitzer. I saw somebody on one of the blogs commented on something I said and said, oh, John Russo is like, he's great. He's like Elliot Spitzer without the hookers. <laughs> uh, I, I thought, well, I guess that's a compliment. <laughs> It's kind of a giggle. <laughs> anyway, well, one thing is clear is that you know Oakland politics. You know California politics. Uh, you're very successful at you know, what you've been doing. Yeah. You have a few missteps. Mm -hmm. You know, congratulations. If you don't want to misstep, you're not running hard enough. You're not trying hard enough. You're not pushing you that, the folks? envelope. If, I tell my kids all the time. That's why they call it practice. If you don't fail, it means you haven't. That's, that's really true. And I'm, I'm comfortable. Yeah. Look, I didn't know Law Corps was going to succeed. How'd you write that again? Oh, actually, it was. was uh, Peace Corps. It's, it? Yeah, it was cool. It was actually, I'll tell you, the idea came up at, uh, as I was having dinner with the, my kid's mom, Chris. Mm -hmm. She was a Peace Corps volunteer. I had been a legal, aid, a legal aid lawyer. And I don't know, somehow in the discussion, we kind of, you know, we were married. We kind of married the Peace Corps to Legal Aid, and that's how... No, I, know, I knew this guy before he was married. That's yeah. another story. Yeah, neighborhood, that's how neighborhood, <laughs> that's what Chris, it was a dinner with Chris. Yeah. It was like, well, that would be a cool thing to try. And, you know, we made a lot of mistakes the first year of Law Corps in terms of how we integrated it into this mm -hmm. office and then integrated it into the bureaucracy, because no one had done a program like that before. Um, and there are things that we've tried to do here inside, as an example, inside the office. Uh, you know, my... I, I tried to create like a little lounge in the office for people to have their lunches mm -hmm. and get to know each other. Yeah, and, and, and you know, but nobody, nobody used it. What they wanted to do is they want to go out at lunchtime and go walk because the weather's good. Yeah. And then, so we don't have a lounge anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. You, you, sure. if you don't fail, you're not being active enough on trying new things. You have to fail. It's okay to fail. Are you going to be at the convention? 
I hope so. I'm not sure yet. I oh, come on, so. you gotta go with me. No, no, no. I'm, if I go, if there's any, you're gonna go and you're gonna go to all those fancy schmancy parties those people have. I want to go. I'm gonna take my kids if I go. My sons need to see this. That's fancy schmancy. I don't even know about. You gotta tell me about this. Oh, thanks for your time. Let's see. You. <laughs> take care. See you later. Yeah. Thanks, pal. That was great. Turn this off.